Before the 2020 Democratic primaries, Marianne Williamson had already made a name for herself as a best-selling author and self-help guru. Her book, A Return to Love, won praise from Oprah Winfrey, saying she had, quote, never been more moved by a book than by this one. Williamson went on to become almost a household name in 2019 when she ran for president in the Democratic primaries and gained attention in particular for this comment she made during the second debate. If you think any of this wonkiness is going to deal with this dark psychic force of the collectivized hatred that this president is bringing up in this country, then I'm afraid that the Democrats are going to see some very dark days. She also made a very eloquent case in favor of uh, reparations for slavery, and that night became the most searched candidate on Google. And although Williamson later dropped out of the race, she's remained politically active ever since, becoming popular with younger voters, especially on platforms like TikTok. And now Marianne Williamson's entering the presidential race again, this time against sitting President Joe Biden, painting herself as the more progressive candidate. Williamson recently laid out what she calls an economic bill of rights, which runs to the left of President Biden's economic policies and includes the right to a job that pays a living wage and universal quality health care. But given she can't win, why is she running? Marianne Williamson joins me now all the way from London. Marianne Williamson, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know it's late where you are. Let's start with an obvious question. Why are you running against Joe Biden? Why do you believe he does not deserve a second term as a Democratic president? You said a couple of things tonight that were interesting. You said, well, he has given more investment in green energy in the Inflation Reduction Act than had ever been done. Yeah, but he also approved the Willow Project, which completely nullifies those investments. He's also given more uh, oil drilling permits even than Trump did. So this idea that he's done more investment in green energy, please let's not pretend this is the great climate change president. You also mentioned that he cut child poverty in half. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, he did with the child tax credit. And guess what? Six months after they did it, it expired and they didn't bother to permanentize it. So uh, there are a lot of ways in which the president has said that he would do things. He's made some incremental changes. I don't want to not give him uh, credit where credit is due, although you did just now. And I think that uh, clearly, if we really want the kind of economic reform uh, that the people of the United States deserve, which certainly was not granted to the American people tonight with this very, very sad uh, uh, negotiation with the debt ceiling, then we're going to have, have a well, president who says like it really is and makes the changes that are necessary. I've also spent much of tonight uh, criticizing his negotiations with the Republicans. Uh, just to be clear, just to be clear, just to be clear, since you mentioned the debt limit, before we get to everything else, much to discuss with you, what do you make of the debt agreement? What would a President Williamson have done differently? You know, it's interesting, because when you spoke about it, there was sadness in your voice. And, you, and then when Robert Rice spoke about it, there was sadness. This was a sad night. First of all, I would never have negotiated with economic terrorists. This is not... Kevin McCarthy was not a good faith actor here. The president does not play to win. And this was a perfect example of that. So why he was ever negotiating, there were some uh, legal scholars who said he could invoke the 14th Amendment. Others said, even if you don't invoke the uh, 14th Amendment, there were other ways he could have gotten the money. So when you say, what would the president have President Williamson have done, I would never have negotiated with that man. The Constitution of the United States says that our, our faith will be good, our, uh, uh, we will be in good faith, our bills will be paid, and our bills could have been paid. He sh I would not have negotiated with that man. So what do you say to those who point out that, yes, you are popular with younger voters and on TikTok, but you can't win a Democratic presidential primary. You're essentially a spoiler candidate. And so by primarying Biden, all you're doing is weakening him in the general and making it easier for a Republican to beat him in 2024 in what will be a very tight election. Well, there are two things about what you said. First of all, you said I'm a spoiler candidate. I'm not a spoiler candidate. I'm running in a primary. So you can't be a spoiler if you're running in the primary. The second thing you said was this narrative you can't win. Isn't that what people said about Donald Trump? I will win if people vote for me. I believe that in a democracy, people should have as wide an array of options before them as there are candidates running on agendas. That's what a democracy is. We need to protect our democracy right now. That's obvious to everyone. The way you protect your democracy is by using your democracy 
Candidate suppression is a form of voter suppression. So this idea that I'm a spoiler, no, I'm not a spoiler. I'm a candidate in a primary, and it's very important, I believe, that the president debate me, that the president debate any other uh, people who are challenging him. At a time like this, when the fascists are clearly at the door, we should be having a very serious yes. conversation about what it will take to defeat them, and not just accepting what the DNC has to say because a few elites oh. have decided it's going to be Joe Biden. Well, if you're, if you're a viewer of the show, and I don't know if you're or not, I'm very clear about the fascist threat, which is why I worry about a divided opposition to a fascist threat. And just to be clear, you're right, Donald Trump did win against expectations. But to be fair, Donald Trump entered the 2016 race and led in the polls throughout. I think there was one brief moment where Ben Carson overtook him. Otherwise, he led the entire time. You got, correct me if I'm wrong, you never went above more than 1% in the polls in 2020. So I have to ask, what makes you think four years later, yes, now is my time? Okay, for, first of all, I've been up to 11% this time, right? That's number one. And number two, there is an ameliorative effect in somebody telling the truth. Somebody needs to tell the truth about this country, which the American people know. Please remember, Matty, 70% of the American people do not want him to run again. The American people, you have 70% of the American people who live with chronic economic anxiety. You have 64% of Americans who cannot absorb a $400 unexpected expenditure. We have 60% of Americans who are living paycheck to paycheck. One in four yes. Americans live medical debt. You have 18 million Americans who cannot even afford to pay the pres uh, for the prescriptions that their doctors agree, give them. Agree on all of that. So what are you proposing to do that's different to Joe Biden? Briefly explain to our viewers, what is your policy platform? Briefly. My policy platform is that the American people should have an opportunity for an economic U-turn, for fundamental economic reform. We should have the same things that the every other advanced democracy has. We should have universal health care. We should have free college tuition and tech school. We should have free child care. We should have paid family leave. We should have guaranteed sick pay, and we should have a guaranteed living wage. We should have an economic bill of rights. We have a country where there has been a massive transfer of wealth into the hands of 1% of our people. It has completely yep. destroyed yep. our middle class, and it is now baked into the cake of how our political system operates, that we will continue to make it easier for people who already have to get more and everyone else to struggle to make it. The majority so, of Americans live with constant economic anxiety in the richest country in the so, world. So I agree, Marianne, with your analysis, and I agree with a lot of the policies that you're outlining. The issue is, I guess, you. And you mentioned Donald Trump. I spent a lot of time on this show referring to Donald Trump as the former reality TV star, not just to be snarky, but also to remind people that he had no business running for president. He had zero experience, zero qualifications. And with respect, doesn't the same apply to you? I mean, I may agree with a lot of your policies, but that doesn't mean that you, Marianne Williamson, self-help author, best-selling author, former spiritual advisor to Oprah Winfrey, are qualified to lead the country, to be commander-in-chief, to run the federal government, to have your finger on the nuclear button. Doesn't experience yeah. matter? Yeah. Well, let's look at all the, what those experienced people have done for us. Look at all those experienced people who took us into Iraq. Look at all those experienced people who kept us in Afghanistan 20 years too long. Look at all those experienced people who look have not Donald raised Trump. them. I, I agree with look, you, but also look at Donald Trump. That's the guy, that's the last person we had, and he had no experience. Hey. Donald Trump's problem as president was not that he had not been in politics. It's his, the nature of his character. If Donald Trump had had a different kind of pe person who surrounded him, Donald Trump would have been a different kind of president. And, you know, the founders did not say that in order to run for president, you had to have had political experience, because they were leaving it to every generation to determine it for itself. What are the qualifications for a leader at this time? My qualifications. Are that I've been around. I've been around enough to see how this country operates. I've been around the very rich and the very powerful. I've been around the very disadvantaged. Do not have money. Do not have power. Okay. And I've seen how okay. this country operates. I've seen it up close. And I am in this candidate in this candidacy, saying what everybody knows: this society is rigged at this point. This society is not even operating as a as a real democracy. We have already moved into the area of oligarchy. Whether it's oil companies or so, defense contracts, insurance where, companies, uh, big. Okay. Uh, Pharmaceutical companies, they run this country, Medi, and you know it. I've heard you say it.
And I said to you, I agree with you on a lot of the policy stuff. But let's talk about you again. You. You mentioned character. Politico in March interviewed 12 of your 2020 campaign staffers who painted a picture, quote, of a boss who can be verbally and emotionally abusive. All 12 former staffers said you screamed at people till they cried. Three said you threw phones at your staffers. You've denied all those allegations, I know, called them categorically untrue. And yet last weekend, your deputy campaign manager resigned, and then your campaign manager resigned back to back. Why is it, Marianne, that so many of the people who work for you don't seem to like working for you? Well, how come so many do, number one? Number two, I've never thrown a phone, OK? Have I raised my voice? Absolutely. I've never thrown my phone at someone. I've never... I, I raised my voice at times. And I'm sorry, you know, if you were tried in a court of law, there are rules of due process. And the person who is being, um, who is being prosecuted has a chance to bring up their own witnesses, et cetera. When you're tried in the media, they can say anything. If I, in raising my voice, have offended anyone or felt made anyone feel bad in any way, then I am sorry. But that doesn't mean that I, I, I think that the narrative that was painted in that picture, in that article, was in any way true. And once again, things like through a phone, never. Okay. One final question. We're out of time, but I've got to ask, just to be clear, yes or no, will you support the Democratic presidential candidate in 2024, whoever it is, against the Republican candidate, whoever that is? Yes or no? You know, Washington, in his farewell address, warned us about political parties because he said people could be more um, into their facts, supporting their factions, than their country. I will support my country. I will do everything I can to keep a fascist out of the White House. But I agree with, Fr with Franklin Roosevelt. We will not have to worry about a fascist takeover in this country as long as democracy delivers on its promises. Democracy is not living... Uh, delivering on its promises. I will do whatever I can to help the American people vote for an agenda by which democracy will deliver on its promises. That's the way to keep a fascist out of the White House. Marianne Williamson, candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for staying up late for us tonight. Appreciate it. I am your fan. Thank you.